up to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. We're going to look at verse 14 to verse 18. John chapter 1, verse 14 down to verse 18. John 1 and verse 14. If you're there, say amen. All right. John 1, verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. Father, tonight as we come now to the studying of Your Word, we ask You, Holy Spirit, lead us, guide us into all truth. Illuminate Your Word to our understanding and our minds. God, help us to know You more. God, You're the infinite God and we are finite. And Lord, there is more of you to be known. And so God, help us to know more of you and to know you more. God, help us to love you more. God, let our affections be stirred tonight as we look at the glory of Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, we know that your ministry, you are come to bear witness to Christ, to, to point to Christ, to glorify Christ. And Lord, as we study about Jesus tonight, I pray, Holy Spirit, make him glorious in our eyes. Lord, anoint me and anoint your people, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Tonight we pick back up in the Gospel of John and we are still considering the introduction, the prologue. We're still in the introduction where John gives in this book. And we see that Christ is the Word. He is the eternal God. He is the creator of all things. He is the one that his word says gives light to all men coming into the world. And as we see again and again and again in the word of God, there is no salvation, there is no grace, there is no heaven outside of Jesus Christ. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. He is the light of all men coming into the world, and all grace and all mercy and all salvation is from him. There's no other mediator. There's no other mediator between God and men except Jesus Christ. Anyone who is ever saved or will ever be saved is saved through Christ. By grace, amen. And we see in this great introduction, the last time we were together, we considered how John kind of changed subjects briefly and then showed us the forerunner of the Messiah, how John the Baptist would come before him and be a witness. And then we looked in verses 10 and 11 that Jesus was in the world and the world was made by him and the world did not know him. That is, God came to the world and the world didn't know God. But then it says in verse 11, even more specifically, that he came to his own and his own did not receive him. That he came to the Jewish people as their Messiah and the Jews rejected him, fulfilling what we read in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 1. Who has believed our report and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? It says down in verse 3 that he was a, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, that he was despised and rejected by men, that he came into his own and his own did not receive him. But then it says... 
in verse 12, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the sons of God, to those who believe upon his name, that as many as receive him, that if you will believe on him, if you will receive him into your life, if you will have that moment, you remember how we talked about when you receive the Lord, it's, an, it's a moment, right? It's a moment. All of your faith in Him, where you believe upon Him, if you receive Him, it says you are given the right to become the sons of God. Man, what a glorious gospel. Amen? What, oh, it's so great of salvation that we have a Savior that if we simply trust in Him, believe in Him, turn from our sin, we shall be saved. And then he says in verse 13, which were born, I love this, who were born not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. That they were born again. We are born again, not by blood. That is, not by the bloodline that you were born into. You're not saved simply because you were born into a Christian household. Born not of blood. You're not saved by your family. Then he says, nor the will of the flesh. That is, it was not your self-exertion that brought about your salvation. You did not do it. You cannot make yourself be born again. Then he says, nor of the will of man. Man could not do that for you. I talked to a dear brother in the Lord just this week and said... Man, if I could do that for people, if I could get into their heart, and ch I would do it. Every day I'd do it. And I would too, but it doesn't work that way. Amen? We're not born again by the will of men, but by the will of God. That our salvation from beginning to end is all by God's grace, and it's all through Him. I don't know if we fully grasp that yet. Even our repentance is His gift to us. The conviction of sin is grace extended to us. Turning from our sin is grace. You remember what Romans 2 says, that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? It's, even, it's His goodness that we can even repent. And it's all of God's grace. And tonight we come to perhaps some of the most profound and glorious statements in the entirety of this gospel. John 1 and 14, it says, And the Word became flesh. And here we see this great reality, the wonder of wonders, the mystery of mysteries. We see, number one, the incarnation of the Word. And the Word was made flesh, the eternal God. The second person of the Trinity, God of very God. And that language, I say, when you hear me say God of very God, there's a purpose for that. There's a significance to even saying that. Because the Son, we're going to see here, is the eternal begotten one. The eternally begotten. There's a theological term called the eternal generation of the Son. That he was not created, but from eternally existed with the Father in relation to the Father as the Son. Eternally generated as the Son. And John makes it very clear to use the word, he was made flesh. Now we know what that is saying if you have a a, a more thought-for-thought thought translation, it would say something like, he became man or was made a man or became human. But he uses the word flesh with a purpose. There's a reason why he says, and the word became or was made flesh. You see, at the time that John was writing this, there was a heresy called docetism. And that may not be the correct pronunciation. And we've mentioned this before. 
And you'll see both Paul and John confront this heresy. But it was a philosophy within the teaching of Gnosticism that they believed that physical matter, like actual physical matter, was in itself inherently evil. Now that's not a biblical worldview, is it? Right? Because our human body is forever sanctified because Christ became man. Not only that, but when in the beginning, when time, space, and matter came into existence during the creation, what was the pronouncement made over creation? It is good. Right? But anyway, there was a false teaching, belief system called docetism where they believed it was from a Greek philosophy that was permeated much of the culture, but they believed that anything that was physical matter, anything. And so with that being said, they began to say that there's no way that Christ was actually truly man because he could not have had an actual body because physical matter is evil. So they said he was simply a phantom or that his sufferings were, they just appeared that way, that they were not genuine or actual real suffering. They just appeared to be suffering. And John combats this, and the Apostle Paul also combats this, and he combats it very directly. In fact, he says, if you believe that, you're not saved. You're not a Christian. You're not going to heaven. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 1, the book of 1 John. We're going to look at chapter 1 and then we're go going to go over to chapter 4. But he says in verse 1, That which was from the beginning, which we have... Heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. We touched him. But then he says emphatically in chapter 4, look at this. He says in verse 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit. Amen. Amen. We are not to believe every spirit. We're not to believe everything that's even done in the name of the Holy Spirit. Right? But we are to test the spirits. How do we test the spirits? Do we do it by some subjective feeling? Now, I believe in the discerning of spirits, a spiritual gift, but what's the clearest way to test the spirits? Amen? Amen? Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits. And here's what he says. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is the first century. They already had false teachers and false prophets, false brethren. Verse 2 says, By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming in, was coming and is now already in the world. That if you deny that Jesus came in the flesh, you are of the spirit of Antichrist. And John is making it as clear as he can, the Word was made flesh. He became, he became man. We see this mystery. This is a mystery, and I'm going to read some quotes to you that are very important for us to understand the significance of this. This right here is one of the most significant things of the Christian faith. That Christ became man. That God became man. The eternal 
pre-existing one became flesh. Truly man, while not ceasing or in any way altering his deity. 100% truly God, but also 100% truly man. That is, his deity did not swallow up his humanity, nor did his humanity in any way corrupt his di divinity. At all. And I'm going to read, I'm going to read an early church creed that was given at Chalcedon, or Chalcedon, however you would say it, in 451. It's one of the most... Beautiful statements on the Incarnation. But before that, I want to read something that really, I believe, will help us to understand. Listen. The infinite became finite. The invisible became tangible. The transcendent became imminent. That which was far off drew nigh. That which was beyond the reach of the human mind became that which could be beholden within the realm of human life. Here we are permitted to see through a veil that which unveiled would have blinded us. The Word became flesh. He became what He was not previously. He did not cease to be God, but he became man, and the Word became flesh. The plain meaning of this, these words is that our divine Savior took upon him human nature. He became a real man, yet a sinless, perfect man. As man, he was holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, Hebrews 7 and 26. This union of the two natures in the person of Christ is one of the mysteries of our faith. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. 1 Timothy 3, verse 16. It needs to be carefully stated. The Word was His divine title. Became flesh speaks of His holy humanity. He was and is the God-man. Yet the divine and human in him were not confounded. His deity, though veiled, was never laid aside. His humanity, though sinless, was a real humanity. Man. For as incarnate, that's why there are statements like this, he increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Because he was truly man. That's why in a boat, he actually got tired, right? He got weary at the well of Samaria because he was truly man and infinite God at the same time, not confounding the persons, not a mixture, right? Not a Herculean type of figure, but God and man in one glorious person, the man, Christ Jesus. Forever now, the second person of the Trinity has a body. Right? The eternally begotten Son who dwelt in eternity past took on human flesh and now inhabits eternity within or holding on or still in a human body. Man, that is right now there is a man seated at the right hand of God. Man, amen. The creed that we read about from 451, and there are others... So many I could have pulled from, but just wanted to use a few. It's a mystery, right? It's a mystery. When you hear the language, we, we understand that. There's an understanding that we have, and it's given by the Holy Spirit. And I don't know about you, but when I hear those things, my heart rejoices, and I believe. 
with all my heart, even though my mind doesn't fully, fully grasp the entirety of it, I don't cast it aside. I believe it with all my heart because it's what the Scripture says. But here's the statement from 451. Therefore, following the Holy Fathers, we all with one accord teach men to acknowledge one and the same Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at once complete in Godhead and complete in manhood, truly God and truly man, consisting also of a reasonable soul and body of one substance with the Father as regards His Godhead and at the same time of one substance with us as regards His manhood like us in all respects apart from sin, as regards his godhood begotten of the Father before the ages, but yet as regards his manhood begotten for us men and for our salvation of Mary the Virgin, the God-bearer, one in the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, recognized in two natures, without confusion, without change, without division, without separation, the distinction of the natures being in no way annulled by the union. Oh, man. But rather the characteristics of each nature being preserved and coming together to form one person and subsistence, not as parted or separated into two persons, but one and the same Son and only begotten the Word, Lord Jesus Christ. Even as the prophets from earliest times spoke of Him and our Lord Jesus Christ Himself taught us and the creed of the fathers was handed down to us. Amen. Hallelujah. Truly God, truly man. The Word was made flesh. God became man. Think about the prophecies that were written in the Old Testament. How you see both natures being prophesied. In Genesis 3, you see the seed of the woman. The book of Deuteronomy, you see the prophet like unto Moses. You come to Isaiah chapter 7 and it says that the virgin shall conceive and give birth to a son and you shall call his name, what? Emmanuel, which means what? What's it mean? God with us. You come to Isaiah chapter 9 and he is called, he is called the, the mighty God, the everlasting father, right? He's the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. But then you come to Isaiah chapter 53 and he is a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Amen. That he was led as a lamb to the slaughter. Here you see both aspects, right? You see God and man, God, truly man and truly God. The Word became flesh. Paul said in Colossians 2 and 9, For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. We see in John 1 and verse 14, and the Word became flesh and, it says, dwelt among us. Here we see His identification with us, that He dwelt among us. Literally, He tabernacled with us. It means He pitched His tent the language that John is using is similar to what we would think of when we thought about the tabernacle where the glory of God rested over the tabernacle or the temple where the glory of God. God wanted to be with His people in the Old Covenant and so He was with His people in the tabernacle in the glory of the tabernacle, the Shekinah glory. But here we see the Word was made flesh, right? And the glory of God became incarnate, right? The Shekinah took on humanity and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father. Hebrews 1 and verse 3 tells us that He is the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6 says that we behold the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We behold the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. 
He dwelt among us. And why? Why? Well, number one, he was our example. Living a life fully surrendered to the will of the Father as the last Adam, as the second Adam, he was our example of godliness and what God wanted from humanity. He is our example. You remember the trend, late 90s, 2000s, the WWJD bracelets and T-shirts? What would Jesus do? He is our example. And he came to be our example. Secondly, he came to experience what it was to be man. The Word of God says that he was tempted in all points as we are yet without sin. That Christ experienced all that we experience in this life. And he was tempted to the fullest degree of temptation beyond what we are. You know why? Because you and I have never fully experienced the full weight of temptation because we yield to it. We've yielded to it. So the full weight is never fully felt in us. But Christ felt the full weight of temptation and never sinned. He felt it all, the full weight of it. That's why the Word of God says that He can be a merciful high priest. Right? Because He knows... He's touched, it says in Hebrews chapter 4, with the feeling of our infirmities. He's touched. He, he knows what our weaknesses is like. He knows what pain is like. He knows what death is like. He knows what that grieving is like at a funeral. He knows what it's like. One of the most profound and glorious statements that you'll ever read is in John 11. It's the shortest verse in the Bible, and it says, Jesus wept. Man. The profound statement that God incarnate knows what it is like to have hot tears coming down his cheeks when he looks at the pain and the suffering that sin has caused in the world. He's touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He's a merciful high priest. Right? But he dwelled among us for the ultimate purpose, to die. He became man to die. Hebrews 2 and verse 9 says that he was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, that he by the grace of God might taste death for every man. He came, became flesh to die. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He bore the sin. He became man in order to do that. The iniquity of us all was laid upon him. This God-man named Jesus. Truly God, truly man, walked Calvary Road, bearing the weight, drinking the cup all the way down to the dregs, bearing the full wrath of the Father, bearing the full weight of the punishment of sin, Paid it in full. Not one mite was left to be paid. Not one thing was left to be paid. He paid for it all on the cross. He dwelt among us. Man, the Word became flesh. And dwelt among us. And then he says, and we beheld his glory. 
The glory is of the only begotten of the Father. He's the only unique, eternally generated Son of God. Unique. There is no other. We are sons by adoption. We are sons by His blood and the grace of God adopting us into the family of God. Sons and daughters. But He is the one and only unique, eternally begotten Son who existed in all eternity as with the Father. Full of grace and truth. All grace is found in Him. Full of grace. Christ is the fountain and the spring from which all grace flows. He is the fountain from which all grace flows. Full of grace and truth. He is the reality of all realities, Christ. All things exist because of Him and for Him, right? For of Him and through Him and to Him are all things. All reality is and exists because of Christ. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He's full of grace and truth. And then we see in verse 15, He comes back to John. Verse 15, he comes back to John the Baptist as the identifier. He says, John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. He makes this reference again of John bearing witness or pointing to him, proclaiming his coming bearing witness to his arrival. You remember on the edge of the Jordan, we're going to see this in a, in a few weeks in the Gospel of John, where on the edge of the Jordan he sees Jesus coming and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God. He bore witness to him and he said, He who comes after me is preferred before me. That is, he is of a higher rank. He's preeminent. He is above me. For he was before me. Now that's an interesting statement because touching Christ's humanity, John the Baptist was six months older than Jesus, right? But here he says, he was before me. He knows this is the eternal God. Then we see in verse 16, his imputation. And of his fullness we have all received in grace for grace. Of his fullness. That is, out of the overflowing, inexhaustible supply of Christ, no lack, we have all received. Of his fullness it speaks of the sum total of the attributes and the power of God. Out of his fullness... We have all received. Every believer has received. Limitless. That is, the grace that is received is not given in part here and a little there. To this one, you get a little bit of it. To that one, it's of His fullness. There is no lack. It's freely to all. Grace for grace. That is, literally, the Greek means grace in place of grace. Grace replenishing grace. Grace will continually follow grace and there will be a never-ending supply. You and I will never run out of the grace of God. Where sin abounded, what does Paul say? Grace did much more abound. We can never out the grace of God. And I am so thankful for that. Amen. 
It's not as if there's only a little supply that is given to you at the very beginning of your Christian life and you get so many chances and then it begins to run dry over time and if you just by chance, if you're holy and good enough at the end and there's still a little grace left, you get to... And that's not how it works. It's grace replenishing grace. It's grace in its fullness. It's grace overflowing. Amen? Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And we need to thank God for that. It's grace, replenishing grace all the time. Never running dry. Amen? Now that's dangerous to preach like that. I I can just live any old way I want. Paul demolishes that, right, in Romans chapter 6 and verse 1. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? What does he say? God forbid. Certainly not. It's an emphatic statement. Emphatically no. Right? It destroys that mentality. Right? But in the course of our human weakness and failure, within our walking in the path of obedience on that narrow path, in our failings because of our human weakness, right? We never run out of the grace of God. Praise God. Never run out of it. And he goes on and he says in verse 17, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The law of God. And here he contrasts the two ministries. Moses and Christ. The law of God was given through Moses. Moses was a servant of God. Moses stood as a mediator within the old covenant between Israel and God. He went up on the mountain and came down, had to put a veil over his face. The law of God is holy. It's pure. The law of the Lord is perfect. Psalm 19 says, converting the soul. But the law does not have power to change the human heart. The law is holy. The law is pure. The law is good. But the law cannot produce in you a desire, it cannot change the heart. And its purpose was never to do that. The law reveals sin. The law is the mirror by which we see our dirtiness. The law, Paul said, was our schoolmaster that directed us or brought us to Christ when Christ came. The law, well, that was the purpose of the law. Nobody has ever been saved by the law. You understand that? Moses wasn't saved by the law. Abraham wasn't saved by the works of the law. No one has ever been justified by the works of the law. Even under the old covenant, it was grace. How do I know that? Explain David. Explain Abraham to me. Lying, saying that Sarah is his sister. Explain Jacob. Explain Aaron making a golden calf. You know what, church? I believe we're going to see Aaron in heaven. Why? Because he kept the law perfectly? Absolutely not. But by the grace of God. All of those blood sacrifices within the temple on that altar, all of that pointed to the ultimate reality. They were but a shadow, right? They cast, a, a shadow is cast, right? You don't bow down and, and stay at the shadow when you see the, the real thing, right? You go to the real thing. Christ is the real thing. 
All of those things were but shadows and types. The law came through Moses. The law cannot save. It cannot produce righteousness. No one has ever been saved by the law, by the works of the law. But then he says, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. That is grace, the full, the full manifestation of God's grace came through Christ. You remember the types, the shadows? Grace and truth came. The full manifestation of God's grace came through Christ in its most full and free display that Christ would come, he would live a sinless life in total obedience and conformity to the will of the Father and that he would die a substitutionary death in the place of sinful humanity and then extend God's free pardon to everybody who will turn from sin and believe on him. The full of grace is revealed in Jesus Christ. There is no other way to be saved. Grace and truth came through Christ. And then we see lastly, verse 18. We see his illumination. No one has seen God at any time. That's a profound statement. No one has seen the essential being of God. No one has looked on God the Father. No one. What did the Lord say to Moses? No one shall see my face and what? And live. Paul said he dwells in unapproachable light that no man can look upon. No one has seen the essential glory or being of God. In the Old Testament, you have what are called theophanies. You have the angel of the Lord. You have the fourth man in the fire with Daniel, right? You have the one like the Ancient of Days. You see Daniel seeing one seated upon a throne. You see Isaiah 6 where the Lord is in his temple and the train of his robe filled the temple. You see these sights, these theophanies where people get a glimpse. And I would say to you that every Old Testament instant where people see God, it is the pre-incarnate Christ. Every time, God is spirit. He's pure spirit, Jesus said in John chapter 4. He's not like unto anything that exists in time, space, and matter. He is pure being. God is spirit. Invisible. But you have these Old Testament theophanies where Jacob wrestles with God, right? Where Joshua sees the commander of the army of the Lord of hosts and he bows down and takes his sandals off and worships him. You know who that was? That was Christ. The angel of the Lord that went before the children of Israel as they were being brought out of the captivity of Egypt. The angel of the Lord is Christ. In fact, the book of Jude tells us that. No one has seen God at any time, his essential being. But here we see the only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father. He has declared Him. 
Here we see the only begotten Son of the Father, the one who is at the Father's side, the eternal begotten one, has declared him, literally shown him forth. He has shown him forth. He is the image of the invisible God. He is the fullness of God in bodily form. He is the exact imprint of His glory, right? Hebrews chapter 1 says, So much so that when Jesus was speaking to Philip in John chapter 14, and Philip says, Show us the Father, and it is enough. And Jesus looked at Philip and said, Philip, have I have been with you so long, do you not yet understand that if you have seen me, you have seen the Father, that I am God in the flesh? The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him, shown Him forth. Literally, if you look it up, it means exegete. He has exegeted, explained, shown forth the Father. Wonder of wonders. Man, what an introduction to a book, amen? What an amazing prologue, right? Study of study. I mean, theologians rack their brains over this and will continue until the trumpet sounds. The glory of Christ, our minds have about this much understanding of His majesty. And oh, that God, by His Spirit, would glorify Christ to our hearts. That we would fall more in love with Jesus. That we would know Him as He is. Truly God, truly man. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. May our hearts truly come to know Him and love Him more and more and more. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Oh, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your word. Thank you that you became flesh and dwelt among us. You lived as we live. Holy. You were pure, spotless, separate from sinners, undefiled. You became man that you might taste death for every man. You came to die in our place. Father, I pray tonight that we would come to know our Savior more and more and more. That we would love Him and serve Him, live for Him. That we with eyes of faith would see him. We would be able to say, as Peter said of that persecuted church in the first century, though you have not seen him yet believing, though we have not seen you, Lord, we believe. And we rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Thank you for who you are. God, help us to love our Savior more and more. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen.